Hello, I'm Ed Murphy with the Astronomy Department at the University of Virginia, and this is Astronomy 1210, Introduction to the Sky and Solar System, Lecture 7, The Reasons for Our Seasons. Well, now that we've had a good look at the celestial sphere, and we understand how objects move across the sky, depending on both our latitude on Earth and their location in the sky, it's time to tackle our next big question. And that question is, why do we have four seasons on Earth? Now, I love teaching about the seasons. And the reason I love teaching about the seasons is this is a little bit of astronomy that you experience every day. Whether it's a cold winter day, a hot summer day, a beautiful cool fall day, or a rainy spring day, those seasons have an astronomical origin. And that's what we're going to explore in this lecture, this lecture and the next lecture. Now, before we get started on the seasons, I just want to find out what you know about the seasons or what you think about the seasons. So I want you to take a second in learning catalytics to briefly answer this question. I'm not looking for a long explanation, just a couple sentences, maybe even one or two will do. And I want you to briefly describe how the annual variation in temperature, that is our seasons, depends on the Earth's distance from the sun. So go ahead and pause this video and go into Learning Catalytics and answer that question right now. Okay, now that you've answered that question, let's go ahead and start trying to answer this question. So the first thing, as a scientist, if I want to come up with a scientific explanation for why we have seasons on Earth, the variation in temperature throughout the year, I'm going to need some data. And of course, as you can imagine, probably the simplest data is a measurement of the temperature on Earth. So to get you to realize and, and to think about this data, I want you to provide some of this data for me. So I want you to go into Learning Catalytics and I want you to draw a graph of the annual variation in temperature throughout the year for the place you, where you were born. Not where you are right now, but the place where you were born. And do it to the best of your ability. So in Learning Catalytics, you will use either your mouse, or if you're using a smartphone or a tablet, you can use your finger or a pen. I want you to draw on this chart the seasonal variation with temperature. So in January, just roughly estimate what is the annual average temperature in January for your, uh, where you were born, and then just finish that curve for the rest of the year. So go ahead and pause this lecture now. Go out to Learning Calytics and do that graph. Don't worry about how accurate it is. I'm not going to grade you. I'm not going to look up where you were born and grade you on accuracy. I just want to gather some data. Uh, and I think it's important for you to realize that this is an inf interesting piece of data that has a direct bearing on the scientific reason for the seasons and it's data that you carry in your head. So go ahead and do this right now. Okay, now that you're back, let's go ahead and use the graph that you just made to answer this simple question in learning catalytics. When is the hottest month where you were born? So which of these months was the hottest month in the location that you were born? Go ahead and take a moment inside Learning Catalytics to answer this question now. Okay, let's take a look at Charlottesville. I wasn't born in Charlottesville, but uh, um, I do think since most of us uh, are spending a significant amount of time here in Charlottesville, it's probably a good chart to look at. This is the annual variation with temperature in Charlottesville. Now, the way I happened to make this particular graph was I took the average between the, uh, the average daily high and the average daily low every day. Um, I think most of you, when you were doing your charts, probably went more by the average daily high temperatures than the, and then the average during the day. And that's because we're usually asleep at night and we don't realize how cool it gets even in the summertime. But don't worry about the details, right? This is a plot of the annu average annual temperature in Charlottesville as a function of the time of the year. And just looking at this, we can find the peak of that curve and we find that the hottest month of the year in Charlottesville is July. 
So had I been born in Charlottesville or had you been born in Charlottesville? I think a very reasonable answer to the previous question is that the hottest month of the year is July. I have a feeling that for most of you that were born in the continental United States or in, the, in uh, Europe, for example, uh, you'll come up with that same answer. But now I want you to answer this question. When is the Earth closest to the sun? So very quickly, go over to Learning Catalytics, answer this question. Don't worry about looking up the right answer. Just go ahead and answer that question. Okay, now that you've answered this question, when is the Earth closest to the sun? Again, we should really gather some data on this one. Um, uh, and, and, and so I want you to help me find the answer to this one. And I think the best way to do this is to have everyone in the class go out and look up the uh, distance from the Earth to the sun on their birthday. So what I want you to do right now is go to the website heavensabove.com. So let me bring up um, okay. On my browser here, I'm bringing up heavensabove.com. That's heavens-above.com. And uh, um, on heavensabove.com, down here, about uh, halfway down the page, is a little thing that says sun. So I want you to click on the sun. And then I want you to type in your birthday. So I'm going to type in my birthday, which happens to be December 16th. And just say update. And it will give you the um, all kinds of inf interesting information about the sun, the time that the sun rises, the time that the sun sets, um, the different twilights that we have in astronomy. And uh, But down here at the bottom, there is the range or the distance of the sun in astronomical units. And on my birthday, uh, December 16th, the sun is 0.984 astronomical units from the Earth. Or a better way to put it is the Earth is 0.984 astronomical units from the sun. And you'll remember the definition of an astronomical unit, that the average distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit. So on your birthday, I want you to look up for your birthday and just your birthday, the average, the, the, the distance from the Earth to the Sun on that day. Again, go to heavensabove.com, find that link about halfway down the page that says Sun, and then in there you can uh, type in your birth date and you will get the, the range or the distance to the Sun on that day. Now I want you to go back to learning catalytics and I want you to plot on this plot just one point. You're not going to do a whole curve like you did last time. This time you're just going to put one point on the plot and it's going to be for your birthday. So find your birthday along the bottom. Obviously, I've just got the months there. Do the best job. I mean, if you're born, for example, December 16th, just go to the middle of December there and put a dot on this graph for the distance from the Earth to the sun on the day you were born. So go ahead and do that in Learning Catalytics right now, and I'll wait here for you. Okay, now that you've had a chance to put your birthday on there, let me show you what it would look like if we had lots of people participating in the lecture right now, uh, which I normally have in class. And this is the Earth's average distance from the Earth to the Sun. Or, or I should say the annual distance, not the average. The average distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit. So this is the average distance from the Earth to the Sun. In January, it's 0.9825 astronomical units from the Sun. In July, up here early July, it's 1.1075 astronomical units from the Sun. And then the distance decreases and comes back down um, uh, in, in late December. I want you to look very carefully at this gra graph and I want you to note the months when the Earth is closest to the Sun, that is the distance is smallest, and when the Earth is farthest from the Sun, that is when the distance is largest. So let's go ahead and we're going to do learning catalytics questions on both of those. The first one is when is the Earth closest to the Sun? On this chart, when is the distance from the Earth to the Sun smallest? Because of course the smallest distance means we're closest together. So go ahead and answer that question in Learning Catalytics. When is the Earth closest to the Sun? Okay. <coughs> 
Now that you've answered that question, I want you to answer the question, when is the Earth farthest from the sun? So you want to find when the Earth-Sun distance is largest. So when is the Earth farthest from the sun? So now go ahead and answer this learning catalytics question. When is the Earth farthest from the sun? All right. Now that we've got all this data, let's actually put it together and examine it for a minute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a table like this. Um, all the months of the year are down there, and then we have the average temperature and we have the distance to the sun. For the average temperature, though, so that it's more applicable across more of the United States, rather than using, using actual temperatures in Fahrenheit or Celsius, I'm going to go ahead and use the words cold, cool, warm, or hot to describe the average temperature. So, for example, I think we can all agree that January is cold, at least here in, in the United States. If you were born in the continental United States, January is cold. February is cold. March is cool. April is sort of cool, maybe a little bit warm. May is warm. June is hot. And if we put all those through the calendar, um, we will see what we get for the months of the year. I am also, in the column on the right, going to put the distance to the sun in astronomical units. And this is what the table looks like when I filled it in. January, February, and March, or well, January and February are cold. March is cool. April is warm. May is warm. June is hot. July is hot. August is hot. September is warm. October is warm, cool. November is cool. And December is cold. So clearly the hottest months of the year are June, July, and August. And I think as we already saw, July is the hottest month of the year. And I think for most of us, January is the coldest month of the year. Now I've put on there, and I want you to take a very close look at this, the average distance to the sun. In January, we're 0.983 astronomical units from the sun. We are closer to the sun than average. In February, we're a little bit farther from the sun. And March and April and May, we're getting farther and farther from the sun until in July, we are 1.017 astronomical units from the sun. We are farther from the sun than average, but we are also at our farthest for the year. And that is something that I need to stop and emphasize. July, when it is hottest, we are farthest from the sun. In January, when it is coldest, we are closest to the sun. And that's worth repeating again. In July, when it is hottest, we're farthest from the sun. And in January, when it is coldest, we are closest to the sun. What this table tells us, what the data tells us, is that the distance from the earth to the sun does not have an effect on our seasons. We do not have seasons on the earth because the earth is closer to the sun in July and farther from the sun in January because exactly the opposite is true. The earth is closest to the sun in January when it's coldest and we are farthest from the sun in July when it is hottest. So if you get nothing else out of the course this semester, and I truly mean this, if you get nothing else out of the course this semester, I want you to understand this one fact. The distance from the earth to the sun has nothing at all to do with our temperatures. Now you might wonder why I start a lecture on the reasons for our seasons with, uh, with this discussion of what doesn't cause our seasons. And the answer is actually something that I think is really important for you to understand for the rest of your life. It's sort of a lesson outside of astronomy. And that lesson is what happens when you try and teach people something, but they already carry in their heads a common misconception. So I'm going to play a video for you called A Private Universe. If you haven't seen it, it's a really brilliant video. It's going to take about 20 minutes, but I think it is something worth watching. Everyone should watch this. It's about conceptual change. If you're going to be a teacher, it is absolutely something you should read about. Even if you're not going to be a teacher, conceptual change is something you should know about. It's basically how do you change someone's mind when they're coming into something with a misconception? Now, there's a lot of literature on this in the educational literature. Uh, and in fact, a lot of it was based in astronomy. Because as you will see in this video, trying to teach things like the seasons, when a young student comes in with a misconception, 
is really very difficult. And after the video, I will talk to you a little bit more about it. Um, but right now, let me go ahead and play the video for you. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg Media. Despite a lifetime of the very best education, students in our classrooms are failing to learn science. Many of these students will graduate from college with the same scientific misconceptions that they had on entering grade school. To test how a lifetime of education affects our understanding of science, we asked these recent graduates some simple questions in astronomy. Consider, for example, that the causes of the seasons is a topic taught in every standard curriculum. Okay, I think the seasons happens because as the Earth travels around the sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather, and, then, and hence the seasons. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun, <laughs> and, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun, and it gets colder when we get farther away from the sun. These graduates, like many of us, Think of the Earth's orbit as a highly exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. I took uh, physics, and planetary motion, and relativity, and electromagnetism, and waves. I've never really had a scientific background whatsoever, and I, and I got through school without having it, and I've gotten very far without having it. I had uh, a, quite a bit of science in high school, yeah, uh, through uh, physics, one, first year and two years of chemistry. Regardless of their science education, 21 of the 23 randomly selected students, faculty, and alumni of Harvard University revealed misconceptions when asked to explain either the seasons or the phases of the moon. When it's further away from um, the sun, then it gets colder. The Earth's position interferes with the reflection of the sun against the moon. Class 1924. To test how standard instruction succeeds or fails in reversing such misconceptions, we interviewed ninth grade students from a nearby high school. The students selected had little training in astronomy. When it's winter, it's when the sun is farthest away from the earth, and when it's um, summer, it's when the sun's closer to the earth. But why is it hotter, say, in the summer than the winter? It's hotter in the summer because we're closer to the sun than we are in the winter. Tell me about the different shapes of the moon. Of the moon? When the sun's right here, the earth blocks the sun rays and it causes the moon to have a shadow right here. So that the monthly the cycle of lunar phases is caused by the shadow of the earth kind of cool. is another popular misconception. Can you tell me about the difference in seasons? What's different about different seasons of the year? In the summertime, it's like we're close to the sun and the sun's um, rays are coming down so it's hot. and. In the winter, you move further away, I guess, and it gets colder. Unlike the Harvard graduates, these students have had virtually no instruction in science. And does the moon have different shapes? Or? No, it's round. It's round. Does it ever look different than round? Yeah, it does. It it's, looks like a half cr crescent. It can look like a half. Mm -hmm. And what causes that? Um, clouds blocking it. Like, say you had a half moon. This is here with clouds, and all you see is the half moon. 
Like a scientist in search of an explanation, this student created his own unique theory to explain the phases. I don't know. I don't know what you've, you got some kind of can of worms here as to why kids don't understand it all. If, if we went outside today and out in the grass there, we'd see the sun up above. Mm -hmm. uh, what, would, what would things look like, um, uh, say, at 8 o'clock? At 8 o'clock, um, the sun would have rotated, well, the earth would have rotated so that the sun would be on the other side of the earth, so then it would be dark here and we'd be able to see the other stars, or the, yeah. Okay, and we, where would the mm -hmm. stars be in the daytime? They're still out there, we just can't see them, because it's not dark enough. Mm -hmm. Heather. Heather's very bright. On a scale of one to ten, maybe I would probably put her at the nine, a little bit above the, the level of the other kids. And I would expect her to know the answers to these things. That's the sun, although mm -hmm. it's a lot bigger. And then um, there's a planet and another planet, and then there's the Earth, because it's the third planet out from the sun. And then there are six more planets. And, okay, the Earth revolves around the sun, the moon, revolves around the earth. So this goes like this and that goes like that. And each time the earth goes like this is a day. And it takes 300, and I'm gonna get it confused, 365 days for the earth to go all the way around the sun and that's a year. You may recognize Heather as typical of your best student. Yeah, I would expect that, that she can give a, a better explanation than the other kids could. I think she has a little bit, and she's a lot more sure of herself. The other kids, I think, might have been a little bit inhibited and were afraid. And I hope she'll tell you what she knows. But the Earth doesn't quite go in a circle. It's more of, let's see, it's more like sort of like that, I think. On probing, we see that Heather believes that the Earth travels in a bizarre, curlicue orbit. And when it's farther away, it's summer. When it's closer right here, it's winter. Okay, it's winter when it's closer and it's summer when it's farther away because of, um, well, at least for us it is. Because when, because of this axis. When the sun's rays are indirect, it's summer because we get warmer. When the earth is closer, the beam, the sunbeams are direct and it's colder. Could you draw a picture of what you mean by direct and indirect? Okay. Well, when the light comes from the sun, when it's direct, it comes straight from the sun to the earth, I think. And when the light's indirect, it sort of bounces off and then comes to the northern hemisphere. It's different. Heather believes that light can bounce and that this somehow causes the seasons. When it bounces off and then come, you know, when it sort of, well, when it doesn't go in a straight line, I guess, it's warmer. It's confusing. What about the moon? What does the moon I look don't know. like? Oh, this, is, this is mind boggling, though. The moon has like four cycles. And so sometimes it's full, sometimes you can only see part of it. Sometimes we just can't see it at all, and other times you can only see this part of it. That's a come that sometimes looks like a sickle. Could you draw me a picture of how that happens? Well, if this is us over here, then we can see the moon, and the rays from the sun sort of come around, and they only illuminate part of the, you know, part of the um, moon, because I guess it's the Earth's shadow or something. Heather's private theories contradict the teachings of even the most elementary science courses. You assume that they know certain things, and even the day that I taught it, I come in and I just assume that they had the basic ideas, and they don't. Heather's teacher was unaware of the students' private theories as she taught them their first formal lesson in astronomy. We're going through changes. Are we the only ones that have changes? You ever hear that about the moon, the phases of the moon? What does that mean, Jean? The phases of the moon. It goes through different stages. Something blocks it. Oh, something blocks it? Yeah, it's like clouds block you it. explain all that to me. Clouds block it? You mean when there are no clouds, that, that it's always full? How about when it's like this? You see that? No. Now, where are we? On the dark side. 
We're here. So when I look up into the sky, what do I see? Nothing. Nothing. You're not going to see anything. The moon is still there, but there's no light being shown on that side that I can see. And Could anybody show? James, do you want to show us? You were showing us earlier? Yeah, what? Could you explain to me why the, the moon has phases and why we see, you know, different things at different times? Can everybody what see? You John, you have a question? Oh, like a half moon. A quarter of a half moon is a crescent? Well, why is it called a crescent? It's shaped like a crescent. Like a crescent. It's curved. It's shaped like, you know those crescent rolls, yeah. right? No, not quite. Well, yeah, actually, I suppose it's all the same. Okay, James, thanks. Okay, does the moon have any light of its own? The, no. Where does it get its light? It gets light from the um, rays that bounce off the sun. What's if another you, word for bounce off? Um, reflect. Reflect, okay. Like, like if you're on the moon, you could see the lights bouncing off the earth. Okay. You know, here, yeah. there's America, and it's nighttime right now. And um, you'd see a half moon right now, because the sun, the, the, the way the moon's facing the sun, is shaped like that. So the moon doesn't actually change shape? No. Oh. It just, just, just the way the sun hits it. Does everybody understand that? John Dixon, did you get that? Yep. Did everybody see that? We interviewed Heather again two weeks after the lesson to see how our private theories were modified by teaching. What I got confused about was um, if the sun's here, what does the path look like when, you know, that the earth takes? And I wasn't sure whether it sort of went like this. Or, whoops. But then we figured out that it sort of went like that. Hmm. <laughs> I'm surprised that she remembered the exact picture she had drawn. I mean, she didn't even hesitate. It was like, right, like this. And, and when we saw it originally, to me, it seemed like such a crazy thing. I mean, that really was her idea of it. It wasn't just, well, maybe it'll be like this. I mean, that really was her idea of how it orbited. First idea you had about this curly cues. Where did, you oh. get, where did you get that idea? I have no idea. It was probably because I was looking in my earth science book in eighth grade, and I looked at another chart and got it confused with this one. In class, Heather was able to reverse the misconceptions she had pieced together on her own from books and other sources. So, this one's wrong. <laughs> but just as often, misconceptions can originate in the classroom. For example, the notion that the seasons are caused by the highly elliptical orbit of the Earth is a misconception which results from perspective drawings found in many textbooks. Let's see how instruction has altered Heather's other theories, such um, as the one she holds about the phases of the moon. The and then here's the Earth, and the moon's turning around it in intricate little circles. So as the um, <clears throat> moon goes around the Earth, um, at different points in time, the sun illuminates different parts of the moon. And um, as it goes around, people on Earth can see different phases of the moon. Um, you know, the full moon, the crescent moon, the new moon. Heather appears able to recreate the teacher's explanation perfectly. What did you, what, and what did you learn in class and what did you know in your In this, in the um, other, in ninth grade class when you came to videotape? That's right. Um, well, we learned the phases of the moon, although we didn't learn where the moon was at those times. So I don't remember learning that. So that makes it sort of hard because you know what the phases are, but you don't know where the moon was. I mean, the moon could be over here, it 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 could be, you know, practically anywhere on its orbit around. But she still has some lingering doubts, and when pressed, shows that she still holds on to her private theory about the shadow of the Earth. I'm almost sure that a lunar eclipse is when the shadow of the Earth is over the moon, so we can't see it. But I'm not sure about the new moon and the full moon. Whether it's, you know, what's in, whether it's that the, um, whether it's that the, it's because the moon's right in front of the sun, so that the back's getting the light and we can't see the light, or whether it's because over here, you know, over here's the new moon because of the shadow. But I think it's over here's the full moon. That would make sense, because if it was just, yeah, I think over here's the new moon and over here. Here, no, over here's the full moon, and over here's the new moon. I'm almost positive about that. Almost, ha <laughs> ha. When did you come to understand that? Well, if, if this was the new moon, then a lunar eclipse would be so special, 
because I would be, that would mean that the shadow would all, you know, would once a month be shutting out the light of the moon or, you know, the light that's bounced off of the moon. Um, and so as it, so then a lunar eclipse wouldn't be so special anymore. You know, it wouldn't be a big thing. It would just be a lunar, you know, it would be um, called a new moon. If Heather hadn't been forced to confront her private theory, she might never have learned the correct explanation. But I also know that what happened was that she had to hold the things in her hands. I mean, you didn't even, uh, whoever was filming her, didn't say, use these to show it. You said, how did that happen? And she immediately took them and started working with them and, and figuring it out. Um, and I think too often that doesn't happen with kids, that they don't get to see, the, to see it exactly in their hands and feel it. We then asked Heather about the seasons and her theory of bouncing light. Because the earth is tilted and the sun is right here. This would be, let's see, this is the northern hemisphere. So then we would be having summer, like that, because the rays would go like that. And down here, they would have winter. And on the equator, it would be summer because it's summer all, you know, all year long because they get pretty much direct rays. But when, let's see, when it's over here, because this part of the earth is showing towards the sun that gets the direct rays and that means we're having summer down here and winter up here again heather gave a perfectly acceptable explanation for the seasons but then we asked her to define the terms direct and indirect direct rays are rays coming directly from the sun um, indirect rays are when they come from the sun and then bounce off another object she does not let go of her theory of bouncing light sort of like if they bounced off a mirror. If you had a light bulb here, a mirror here, and if you just did a light bulb so it was like that, light would bounce off the mirror somewhere else. And um, so if you had a mirror here and a light here, the light would bounce. And here we would have winter, I guess because it would sort of bounce or something. I don't know where she picked that up. Somewhere along the line she did, and she just doesn't want to let go of it. Since Heather's misconceptions were not directly addressed in the class lesson, we tried to alter her inappropriate definition of direct and indirect light through one-on-one -on -one instruction. Notice how she tries to blend these new concepts into her old. Is here and the, and the sun's rays are going directly to the northern hemisphere. That would be summer. Because like, you know, the rays would be stronger both because they weren't getting interrupted for anything and because the rays of the sun would be closer together like shown right here. And when it's, when the northern hemisphere is farther away, it would be winter up here because the, um, the rays from the sun would be hitting at a slant and it would sort of bounce off other parts of the earth. Her own personal theory is so deeply ingrained that despite our attempts, she never abandons it. I guess you have to realize that kids really do have the ideas coming in and you think it's that it's like a void, but it's not. It, they, have, they have experiences and they have ideas that they associate with other things. And until you kind of straightened out those initial ideas... It kind of closes off their minds to what it is you're trying to get across to them, really. That's 23.5 degrees. That's the angle of the tilt. It's not, it's not that much. It's not that much, but it's enough to give us the four seasons. Every time we communicate, New concepts compete with the preconceived ideas of our listeners. All students hold these ideas, but they are unaware of their private theories. The ocean under the moon has... Because it spins the, the, sun, the spot on the Earth where the sun is, moves. Do you think we are in terms of the, uh, the rotation that we make? We must make them aware. Only then can we enable them to learn and free them from this private universe.
I love that video for a couple reasons. Um, and the first one is it teaches us a lot about how to teach things to other people. And even if you don't find yourself in the formal role of a teacher in the future, you will find yourself at many times in your life having to get across a point, a point across to someone and always remember that they are bringing into that conversation ideas of their own. So why is teaching the seasons um, uh, one of my favorite things to teach? Um, it's one of my favorite things to teach for a couple reasons. The first one is if you grew up in Virginia, you learned about the seasons in fourth grade and sixth grade, and then again in ninth grade if you took earth science. Most of you have seen the seasons at least once, if not twice, and maybe three times in your educational background before getting here to the University of Virginia. And yet I know from talking to students and asking these learning catalytics questions over the years that the majority of students still carry in their minds that misconception that the Earth's distance to the sun has something to do with our seasons. Now, I don't blame you for doing this, and let's explain why this is. Why is it that that is such a powerful misconception? And the answer is really simple. Throughout your whole life, literally from the moment that you were born and started learning, you have learned that closer means more. The closer you are to the fire, the hotter it is. The closer you are to the sound, the louder it is. The closer you are, the more you get. The farther you are, the less you get. The farther you are from the speaker, the quieter the sound. The farther you are from the fire, the cooler it is. And that is something that has been reinforced every day of your life, every single day. That basic fact is being reinforced over and over again. Closer means more. So it's not too surprising then when we have something like the seasons and there's a time of the year when it's hot and it's a time of the year when it's cold, that students, that people would fall back on this very basic idea that closer means more. And that, well, if it's hotter, we must be closer to the sun. And if it's cooler, we must be farther from the sun. And that's why we have to use data like this chart that I've got displayed here to try and work on a scientific understanding for the seasons. Because this basic idea of closer and farther does not explain our seasons. In education, they sometimes call these basic facts that you carry in your head primitives. And they've been backed up so many times that you just, without even thinking about it, you rely on them, you believe in them. And this is a case where common sense and intuition fails you. And it fails you terribly because, as you can see from this chart, our distance to the sun has nothing at all to do with our seasons. Now, in education, the primary way that it was thought that you could address misconceptions like this is simply teach the students the right answer. Simply teach them the scientific model for the seasons. But what a private universe pointed out and lots of other educational research that goes with it is that if you just teach someone the right answer, they will probably try and incorporate it with their previous answer, as you saw that young woman doing in the video where she learned new information, but then kept falling back on her prior information to try and answer the question. Those misconceptions can be deeply ingrained in your mind, and you have to work on getting them out. And if you're a teacher, the primary way to help students get those misconceptions out of their head is to show them that what they know is wrong. And so what I hope I have shown you so far is that if you are one of those people that thought that our seasons has to do with our distance to the sun, that that is incorrect. That model does not work. That model does not explain our seasons. So let's go on and let's start building up a scientific model of the seasons. But before we do that, I want to finish addressing this misconception and then it won't be until the next lecture that we actually build up that scientific model. But, uh, but let's talk a little bit more about this misconception just to make it clear that our distance to the sun has nothing at all to do with the seasons. Okay, so the first thing to know is that the Earth's orbit around the sun is so close to a perfect circle that when I draw it on a diagram like this, you can't tell that it is not a perfect circle. You've probably learned, and it's true, and we'll study it later this semester, that all the objects that orbit the sun orbit the sun in a figure that's an ellipse. And there are times when the object is closer to the sun and times when the object is farther from the sun. And it's true, the same is true with the Earth. 
when the Earth is closest to the sun, we're at 147 million kilometers. And when we are farthest from the sun, we are 152 million kilometers from the sun. Now, that sounds like a big difference, right? Five million kilometers difference between when we're closest and when we're farthest. But let's think about it this way. Let's think about you being around a campfire. You're really, really cold and you're standing around a giant bonfire. So imagine a huge bonfire and you're cold and you're putting your hands up and you're warming your hands against the fire. And imagine that you stood 14.7 feet away from the fire, a little bit less than 15 feet away from the fire. And then imagine that you take a step back a little bit and you're 15.2 feet from the fire. That is, you start at 14 feet from the fire and you go back to a little bit more than 15 feet from the fire. Now, here's the thing. The fire is about 15 feet away and you have hardly changed your distance at all. In fact, to go from 14.7 feet to 15.2 feet, you're moving just about six inches or so. And I think what you realize is moving your hands back by six inches like that it's not going to terribly change the temperature of your hands. In fact, your hands are really not going to change any temperature at all because you really haven't changed the distance that much. The difference between when we are closest to the sun and when we're farthest from the sun, that change is so small that it doesn't make any difference or it makes hardly any difference at all. And that campfire is a really good example. Like I said, you put your hands up, you move your hands a little bit farther away. It's just not going to make much difference. It's certainly not going to explain the difference between a hot day in July and a cold day in January. Because a hot day in July and a cold day in January are really very different from one another. And just moving your hands back a little bit are not going to suddenly cause your hands to start freezing. But actually, this campfire gives us a hint as to what does cause our seasons. We'll get into the scientific model next time. But when you stand around that campfire and you're warming your hands like this, it turns out you put your hands up like this. You don't put your hands up like that. And you don't put your hands up like this because then your hands are just intercepting a little bit of the heat from the campfire. You put your hands up like this because now they're intercepting the maximum amount of heat from the campfire. Uh, and so this is the difference, as you saw in that video, between direct rays, where the rays are hitting at a very high angle, and indirect rays, where the rays are hitting at, uh, at a very low angle. That is, it's a glancing blow instead of hitting head-on like that. We'll talk more about this in, in the next lecture on Lecture 8, but I just wanted to get that point across right now. Now, just to define a couple terms here, perihelion is that moment in time when we're closest to the sun. Peri means closest and helion means closest to the sun. So when satellites orbit the Earth, there is a perigee. Um, peri meaning closest and G from geo meaning Earth. But perihelion is when we're closest to the sun and that occurs every year on or around January 3rd when we're about 91 million miles from the sun. And aphelion, ap means farthest and helion of course from the sun, is around July 4th of every year when we're about 94 million miles from the sun. So we are farthest from the sun in July when it is hottest and we are closest to the sun in January when it's coldest here in the northern hemisphere. So like I said, the Earth's orbit is so close to a perfect circle that, um, that the distance to the sun makes no difference in our seasons at all. Now, there's another point to think about when it comes to our seasons and that is the different hemispheres have different seasons. When it is summer in the northern hemisphere, you might know that it is winter in the southern hemisphere. That is, um, when it's winter in the north, it is summer in the south. And I think a really beautiful example of this is to think of a holiday, which we usually consider to be a wintertime holiday, at least those of us that were born and raised in the northern hemisphere. And the one that comes to mind immediately is Christmas. So Christmas, which occurs on, January, uh, on December 25th of every year, is usually pictured as a wintertime holiday, right? Santa Claus dresses up in a fur coat with a fur hat. We, uh, we decorate our trees. Um, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas where you're thinking of snow outside. Um, uh, you know, I'm thinking of um, uh, sleigh bells and, and sleighs and snow. We think of Christmas as being a wintertime holiday. What many people forget, though, is that in the Southern Hemisphere, Christmas is a summertime holiday. In fact, Christmas 
is at the very beginning of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. This is a photograph of Santa arriving on Bondi Beach in, uh, in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, on Christmas Day. Now, I can tell you, I grew up in Chicago, um, and uh, on Christmas Day, we did not go swimming at the beach on Christmas Day in Chicago. But in Australia, Christmas Day is a holiday, and it is a day that very often people will go to the beach because it is the beginning of summer in the Southern Hemisphere. So the seasons are inverted from one another. When it is summer in the north, it is winter in the south. When it is winter in the north, it is summer in the south. So the seasons are opposite. And here's the thing. If the seasons were due to our distance from the sun, because we all live on the same planet together, we would all be closer to the sun or farther from the sun, right? You can't get just Australia closer to the sun and the United States farther from the sun because we're all traveling together on that same planet. Um, and, and of course, as we travel closer and farther from the sun, we travel millions of miles closer and millions of miles smaller. And the size of the earth is tiny compared to that change in distance. So we're all traveling together, right? When we talk about the distance of the sun, everybody on earth is basically the same distance from the sun. It's like me asking how far away is Los Angeles? You don't usually say, if I say for, from where I'm sitting right now in Charlottesville, how far away is Los Angeles? Your first thought isn't, do you mean downtown Los Angeles or the nearby suburbs of Los Angeles? Um, yes, the nearby suburbs are a little closer, but when we're talking about the distance from Charlottesville, we're talking about the distance to both of them. It hard, the, the distance from downtown to the suburbs makes hardly any difference. So those are some thoughts I want you to think about. The distance to the sun has nothing at all to do with our seasons. What we're going to do in lecture eight is we're going to build up a scientific model for what causes the seasons on earth. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're going to spend all of lecture eight doing is building up this scientific model. But for now, as I said, if you get nothing else out of this course this semester, I want you to know that our distance to the sun does not cause the seasons on earth. And I'll tell you why I think this is important. Uh, I think this is important because it, a lot of educational research has been done on this and a very large segment of the population in the world, but the United States as well, um, where most of the educational literature that I'm familiar with has come from. Uh, many people in the general population don't know this basic fact about our seasons. They don't know that our distance to the sun has nothing at all to do with our seasons. And yet the general population is being asked to make decisions about very complex scientific issues such as global warming. And yet we don't, many people don't even have a simple understanding of our seasons, which means that they don't have a good understanding of global warming. And so I believe it is my job as a science educator to, um, to educate the public on issues like this, to make them more informed, because you really cannot at all understand global warming if you don't at least understand what causes the seasons on the earth. So this lesson about the seasons also has important implications. You will for the rest of your life, being, being having to make decisions about what you personally, and if you are in a leadership role, what you as a nation or a state might do about global warming, I at least want you to know the basic facts about what causes our seasons. Okay, enough for now. I will see you in lecture eight, where we will build up a scientific model for our seasons.